Welcome to the One Million Years of Joy podcast. I'm Dr. Andrea Benacar, your host, and my intention is to inspire you to find more joy in your life through the stories from our guests and the science on joy and purpose. Marjorie, hi, it's such a pleasure to have you with us today. Hi, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here, actually excited. Marjorie, please take us through your journey of being an entrepreneur. Where did the inspiration start? And tell us more about the adventures you have been on over the last couple of years. So my background is actually PR and communications. That's um, what I did. And then I'm a single mom. And back in, I think it was 2014, Swedish, my daughter came to me with a drawing and she asked me to turn the drawing into something real. Actually, by that time, I own an advertising agency. So my first reaction was, oh, let's make her a drawing, like something digital or just grab her drawing and make it talk. And then I was like, well, wait, she's six. Like, I don't want her on screen time that much. What can I do? And then I come up with the idea and I was like, I know I'm going to make her a plush inspired on her drawing. Of course, I didn't know anything about sewing, still very bad at it. So I hired a seamstress and I was like, okay, here's the challenge. Like we need to make this drawing exactly the same as a plush. Can you do it? And we tried and we itinerate a few times and then final result, I give the drawing to my daughter and then I give her the plush. And after seeing the reaction on her face, when she realized that something she drew was actually like tangible, I was like, okay, this is what I want to do for a living. So I posted her picture online on my Facebook, just sharing like on a personal story and it went viral. So people here, I'm in Uruguay. And then people started to um, place orders. So before I knew it, I was kind of entering in that. It was not on purpose. It was not like something that I looked for. It was just something that came to me, which I'm extremely grateful because that business turned out to call Te Dibujo, which means I draw you. So with Te Dibujo, I spent six years working with women under different stress situations like Either they were just coming out of jail or they were victims of domestic violence trying to like leave their homes. They were like very struggling women. So I was filled with joy to be able to actually like work with them and help them somehow to make a living. And then in 2016, I got selected by President Obama to be a part of the first cohort ever actually of the Young Leaders of the Americas Initiative. So I spent a month and a half in the U.S. being trained by high-end CEOs. Richard Branson was one of our master classes. So you have an idea of the kind of people that trained me, which was mind-blowing. That was actually at the State Department. So it was like doubly mind-blowing. Like Richard Branson at the State Department was like all crazy. And then I got selected again to meet with Obama in person. So I traveled to Peru to meet with Obama, which was... An amazing uh, experience. So all of that was so inspiring. Like I was surrounded about the social entrepreneurs from all over Latin America and the Caribbean, learning from all of them a ton. Then I came back and kept working. And then 2018, I think, I won a scholarship to do my master's degrees at Columbia's University with the dibujo, thanks to my endeavor. And then mid-master, I was studying with my daughters and going through her textbooks, and I started noticing that nobody was telling her anything about women in history. So I started asking her, do you know who Madame Curie was? Do you know who Malala Yousafzai is? And so on. Like, I started listing names, and she was like, no, I have no idea. And I was like, wait, nobody teaches you that at school? And she was like, no. And I said, okay, we have an issue. <laughs> so I went online And I started Googling like different resources for me as a mom to teach her about women in history. And I started noticing like there was nothing, like just barely some kind of books were starting to uh, show up, but there was nothing playful, nothing that was fun to learn. And it's a scientific fact. We learn better through play. That's a done deal. So I decided to stop with the dibujo, which is an endeavor that I love dearly, but it was not scalable. It was like literally one drawing, one uh, blush and jump fully in on Little Rebel. So I went to my master's degrees director, explained the situation, asked for the permission to like change the dissertation. And I developed the entire business plan 
on the last three months of the master's degrees, was able to get my partnerships done, my samples done and start going. And then before I knew it, Little Rebels was born. And in March, 2020, literally three days before the pandemic hit, I launched a Kickstarter campaign to found the dolls, the first batch of dolls. And then <laughs> that was March 8 in order to honor like Women's Day. And then March 13, I think it was the pandemic was declared. And I was like, okay, yeah. So the entire first month, people were trying to buy frozen pizza and um, toilet paper, and I was selling plush dolls. So it was a challenge itself, but I was able to actually gather the money and then be able to produce the first batch of dolls, which I first started delivering them, if I'm not mistaken, September 2021. Honestly, it's like this entire COVID years, it's kind of blurry, but something in between. When... I finished my dissertation at Columbia. The director decided not to give me my diploma because I changed companies mid-master, even though he authorized that, which was a huge fight that I had. And I found out about that I was not going to get graduated an, an hour earlier than the graduation. So he called me into his office to say, oh, I thought about this a lot. You were one of our top students, but your company was not. And I was like, well, yeah, we changed companies. Like, I'm just getting started. And he was like, yeah, we cannot have your logo on our website, so we're not going to give you your diploma. And that broke me into a million pieces. I, of course, it's not the only thing that broke me, but there was kind of like, it, re it, it hit really hard. Like, going into U.S. college was always my dream that I never was able to fulfill because it was super expensive for me when I was growing up. And Colombia was my top choice. I was between Sarah Lawrence and Colombia. So being able to actually go to Colombia at 30 something with a scholarship, it was like literally a dream come true. And then coming back with no diploma after all the effort that I put through and like, it, it was really hard. So I came back, got into a super severe depression, spent like three months on the couch, would not even like take a bath. It was really bad. Got off thanks to hypnotherapy, like at that level. And then just in time for Women in Toys event in the U.S., in which I got selected to pitch Little Rebels to um, all the big players in the industry. So here I was, like, meeting with Walmart, Spin Master, Hasbro, all these big companies, and all I had literally were the dolls. Like, I had nothing else, just the dolls, the samples. And I got amazing feedback from them. They kept asking, like, do they come with a book? And I was like, holy cow, I need to do a book now. Like, I didn't want a book, but it makes sense. Yes, they need, like, they need the story behind it, right? So I developed the app that comes with the dolls, that when you scan their faces, you can see videos, ebooks, trivia, augmented reality, like all these educational features, fun for kids to learn. And now, three years later... I am finally launching the books. <laughs> Took me a while to like get my head around it. I just wanted to try really hard first with the dolls and everything, which we did really good. And after that, it was like, we won the Taggy Awards. So like so many people, so many people, so many people, you have no idea. So many people told me like, this is, are we allowed to swear here? Yes. Don't okay. worry about it. <laughs> No, because like I, I want to be, I want to be as truthful as possible to the things that I heard. This is shit. Nobody's gonna ever buy a doll from a real woman. Like, don't even spend your money on this. This is like an awful product, an awful name. Nobody's gonna want this. So that was for the entire first year of Little Rebels. What I heard the most, of course, from white old men. <laughs> and then like not a single woman told me that <laughs> I can assure you but then we won for the awards for the best uh, toy and then we were competing for toy of the year with Baby Yoda which is like a huge character from the Star Wars franchise and we were literally competing like side by side with the most sold toy in the world and I was like, yeah, nobody's going to want this shit. <laughs> like, you're right, which was amazing. So that put us on the map. 
And after that, I was able to sign with Macy's. So our dolls are at Toys R Us and Macy's. And from there, we just kept growing. We are like all over museums, toy stores, airports, and we're trying to conquer the world one doll at a time, pretty much. That's what we're doing. Congratulations. And, and thank you so much for sharing the ups and the downs of your journey, because often when we look at entrepreneurs, we forget that it's a journey that is tremendously challenging. And particularly for women, I myself in, in all the adventures I've been on uh, creating various companies was not actually even aware of the complexities of funding. And when you're looking at a total number of uh, funds that VCs allocate to women owned businesses, it is such a small percentage. Of Less than 2%. But it was good that I was not aware of those statistics when I started my own businesses. I know. Right? <laughs> it's, it's actually quite incredible when you stop and think about it. So I am so happy that despite the challenges you have shared, that you were able to continue pressing forward and prove the, the people that didn't believe in you wrong. And I just find this so beautiful. It's testament that we should never give up. And if we really are passionate about what we're doing, the perseverance that and the strengths we can find in difficult times is, is incredible. And what I'm curious to, to learn also from you, particularly as you were navigating and launching your company during the COVID period, and we were hearing about the supply chain issues and problems where did you choose actually in the midst of all this situation to produce your dolls and, and now the, the book that you have just shared? Because even today, as I'm talking with various organizations, big and small, they're still telling me about the supply chain issue. So you are like in the middle of this pandemic with so many challenges that came with it. How did you navigate that? And where are you actually producing your dolls and your books today? So still in China since day one, which is insane. We, we are always looking for backups and plan Bs just in case. But the truth is factor that we work on they're super professional, like the quality, it's insanely good. We have an extreme good relationship. Like we've been working for three years. Like for me, they're the perfect partners. I trust them. Like they know already what to do. Like it's not that easy to find a good manufacturer that you can trust, especially um, overseas. When I never traveled, like I was not able to go to China. It was the midst of COVID. So I never been there actually. And to be honest, when I first started this business, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> like I literally pick a factory because I just look for which brands did they work with in the past. And so since they used to work with Coke and Unilever and all these like big players, I was like, they must be good. Otherwise this big brand. So that was the way that I picked the factory because I had no idea like which factory to be and all of that. So it was a journey lesson. And by the time that I got into this, I was not expecting COVID to hit like nobody was expecting. But, um, and, and, and I was not expecting the impact in the supply chain either. It never crossed my mind that I was not going to get the dolls. And it actually, I was so lucky because I was not in a hurry. So... I got the dolls eventually, like it, it cost me a few months more than probably if COVID wasn't there. But again, I was just getting started. So it was not an issue for me. And nowadays, maybe it's because of the volumes that I handle. Uh, I don't handle like 20,000 dolls per month. Like my, my inventory are lower than that. So I guess on that end, it's not a big issue for me because I can fit in any container, like any available space. It's not that I'm putting together an entire container just for me. So for now, we're good. Um, definitely something to look out and try to find like different places. I did, however, like scouted the entire Latin America to produce the dolls here, both for convenience in case something happened, but also to empower like Latin Americans, artisans, but you cannot compete with the quality and the times and the production and everything that that is in China. The truth is that they are impeccable in what they do. They know what they're doing and it's kind of unbeatable at this point. And when you mentioned that everything started with a Kickstarter campaign, tell us more about that journey because there's also many individuals that use such channels to raise funds. 
but they're not successful. What do you believe were some of the key elements that allowed you to be successful and raise the funds that you needed? So I literally just closed my first investment round. So I've been 100% bootstrap in this company since yesterday. <laughs> until until yesterday. Yesterday, I officially closed my first investment round on a platform that is similar to Kickstarter that's called WeFounder, in which people actually go in and fund their business with an investment, right? It's different from Kickstarter. Like in Kickstarter, they're buying your product. On WeFounder, they're investing in the company. It's different concepts, but pretty much the same dynamic, if you like. Kickstarter, I would love to say that if I knew back then everything that I know now, my campaign would have been way more successful than it was. I was able to raise the money that was missing the last 48 hours of the campaign, which was one of the most stressful things I have ever done. And because I did partnerships with others that were raising as well, we shut out, shut out each other in our newsletters and stuff like that. But I would say like success of both of my campaigns, 100% network. Because like Kickstarter, for example, in order for you to be picked by Kickstarter as product that we love and have them put you on their email list, which is what it's going to help your campaign grow and go viral and all of those things, you need to do a lot of work. So you either hire an advertising agency that specializes in Kickstarter and spend a lot of money on that, or you beat the algorithm. So Kickstarter pick the campaigns that are doing the best on the first 24 hours. If you are able to found your campaign in the first 24 hours, that's a win for sure. And then you have the entire month to raise the rest of the money, right? So what I suggest, everybody that like comes to me and say, how can I do this? I would say like, how much money do you need? Like, let's say you need $10,000, ask for five and make sure you have those five between you, your parents, your friends or whatever. And when the campaign launch, have everybody from different computers and IPs. And if it can be from different countries, even better to put money on it because it generates traffic to your campaign. And then the algorithm will see that your campaign is doing good and it's generated interest. And it's going to take a look at your campaign and your product and everything. So if you're able to be fully founded by then, everything else, it's just extra on top of what you're doing. And then you have 30 months to keep rising, which is not the same to run a campaign when you have raised, I don't know, from $10,000, you're barely at 500 versus you need $10,000, but you already have fully founded 5,000 on the first 24 hours. Tricks. There's a lot of, I'm happy to share them. There's a lot of like little tricks that you start to find out after. Like all of this I learned after, by the way, <laughs> my campaign was done. <laughs> I had no idea at the beginning, like what I was doing, but uh, I was there like just struggling and asking everybody like, hey, jump in with $30, $50, like everything makes a difference. It really does, especially if it comes from several sides. And in your latest campaign on WeFounder, did you approach it in a similar way or did you take a completely different approach now? So WeFounder is different, right? Because it's an investment again, and it's not, I'm not selling product. I'm telling you invest in my company and you have several vehicles to invest. You can either invest for equity, you can invest with the safe, or you can choose revenue-based funding, which is what I chose, which basically is you're loaning me the money. So you're giving me $100 and I'm giving you $200 back on a maximum of three years. And I'm going to pay you from the 5% that I generate from my revenues. If the company generates zero revenue, you're not going to get your money back. The more the company sells, the faster you get your money back. That's what I chose. So the approach is completely different. Like you literally go, but again, network. 95% of the investments came from my personal network of people that I've met over the years and that I like, hey, I think this is going to be interesting for you. And the fact that they can invest as little as $100 helped a lot because a lot of people want to support me, but they don't have like $5,000 to come in with an investment or $25,000. They can just come with 100 And then the last day of the campaign, I was $5,000 short to close my goal. So I did a video and I posted on TikTok and on Twitter. And I literally asked my country, like I just talked to, I just spoke to Uruguay and I was like from one Uruguay to another, I want to ask you, please help me achieve this goal. $100 each one of you. It's an investment. I will bring you back in the next three years on 200. And that's exactly what happened. Not only we reached the goal, but we surpassed it. Like 
we're over four thousand dollars on top of what we were looking for. So it's I would say people, <laughs> like people, community. It's super important. And for me, I think what what makes the success behind this, it's first of all, I'm super transparent. Like it's what I was saying before we started this interview, what you see is what you get. Like people go through my social media and I tell them the ups and the downs, especially the downs. Cause I think it's super, like everybody always use, as you're saying, to see like entrepreneurs when they're super successful and all fancy clothes dressed and going from a jet to an art. Like that's like, honestly, that's not true. That's like a few lucky and most of them, I'm not saying everybody, but most of them already come from a family with big bucks behind to support them. Those that really are made from the very, very bottom, they most probably are going to struggle a lot in order to be able to get where they want because they don't have a fancy last name that everybody is going to open the doors to magically just because you come from or whatever. You need to make your, your way into the industry that you're choosing. And it's super hard. And it's discouraging and you go from, I'm going to declare bankruptcy to get an email that's going to change your life. Like that's literally what it is. I would say the resilience, but also the strain to deal with that imprecision and like not, nothing is secure. Like it's super stressful. People say, oh, entrepreneurs have it, like I'll figure it out. They just go like traveling the world and working from their computer. Like you have no idea what you're talking about. Like I haven't slept since I started this business. It's like I haven't taken a day off. I haven't slept. Like seriously, I work way more as an entrepreneur than I used to work when I was like in an office. And plus you're a single mom. So how did you juggle the challenges linked to entrepreneurship and also raising a, a young child. So I'm lucky that I have my mom. My mom helped a lot, especially with my, like I, I have to do a lot of travel. So with who's taking my daughter to school and who's taking care of her while I'm gone, that's my mom. And I have a group of friends that I love dearly that been with me since my daughter was very, very, like she was, I think, two years old. So it's kind of like their aunt that whenever needed, they always jump in and then they will pick her up and bring her home. And well, now she's 16, so it's a little bit easier versus when I first started. But yes, yeah, support, like you need to have a support network. It's not easy, especially when you're a solo founder that you don't have like a co-founder that you can maybe separate tasks and say like, hey, you do this and I will do that. Or like, I cannot go to this toy show because my daughter is sick. Can you go? That, like that did, it was not an option for me. So I had to rely a lot on the people that I had around me and my daughter. Like my daughter was struggling a lot. She had depression and then borderline personality disorder. So she had like a few really rough years. And it, ironically, they were the two first years of my company. So that was a, like, I literally, I was at that moment seeing someone and I cut off every relationship that I had. And I just focused on my daughter and my company for like two years, no social life, no going out, no nothing. That's how I juggled. It was impossible otherwise. Like I fully focused on my daughter being healthy and creating a company that was all that matter and my four dogs <laughs> that was all that mattered to me <laughs> do you have any regrets I, I i'm curious as a result of making that tough decision to just invest so much time and energy in building your business and raising your daughter i don't have regrets in my life at all i think everything i did was because of something either good or bad there's lesson learned there. Regret, it's kind of like a very strong word that I don't feel I have any. And I look back and would I have done some things differently? Probably, because now I know better. So I know that I could maybe take it on a different road or like maybe not spending money in a specific toy show because nothing came out of it and allocated into the, like, yeah, well, of course, when you're already on the other side, you look back and you say, oh, I should have done this or that. But to be honest, I barely stopped to look back. Let's start from there, which is a gift and a curse at the same time, because it's easy to forget how far you've come when you don't take a minute to appreciate everything you've done. But also it's what keeps me going, right? I don't stop to look to my mistakes. I just keep going. I learn from them and I keep going. 
So no, I don't have any regrets. I think everything developed the way it was supposed to for me to learn the things that I needed to learn, good or bad. And I'm super grateful, actually. You've met some incredible men that you mentioned from Obama to Richard Branson while you were in the US. Were there any specific insights or conversations that you can share that truly moved you and inspired you? To be really honest, no. <laughs> First off, my memory is awful. So I'm, I'm very bad at retaining information that does not impact me like for good. And I'm not able to tell you neither Obama or Richard Branson impacted me more than they have already by stuff that I was following on social media or watching on the news or stuff like that. Like nothing they said those days was different of what they usually say, especially Richard Branson for me. I think he is super inspiring and his journey is super inspiring. And I learned a lot about entrepreneurship, reading his books and, and like watching him and, and listening to his talks and everything, but inspiring. Sarah Blakely is inspiring for me more than Richard Branson or the president itself. I'm sorry. Like that's the truth. Like a woman that goes from selling fax machines door to door to build a company like Spanx by having the over is enough to get the buyer from Neiman Marcus, take it to the bathroom with her and strip down just to show that her product work respect. Like that's something that I would have done a hundred percent, but not everybody. It's like that, right? Like she was not afraid of rejection or being taken away by the police. Like, I don't know, like she was literally stripping down in front of someone. Like that's not something that you usually do when you go out and sell your product. So if you ask me, she's way more inspiring than any other person that I've met. And I had never met her. Actually, that's on my bucket list. Uh, it's to meet with her, but I don't think I had like, I have, that's a very good question. You've got to be thinking like, I, I don't think I have one specific inspiring event or moment or phrase or conversation. I think I have a sum of experiences. I've learned so much, like from the Obama experience, for example, which I was with Richard Branson and Obama, the persons that I learned the most were the entrepreneurs that were with me. They were social entrepreneurs out there fighting like real problems. One was feeding people that had nothing to eat by creating healthy agriculture in his country where nobody had access to. The other one was building shelter. The other, like they were doing all amazing things. So for me, that's inspiring. They on the service to others on that way. That was the moment that I knew I was going to become a social entrepreneur. Like I had no doubt. I was like, I was born to do this. I'm born to serve. The way I do it is through Little Rebels today. I hope this will go out from four days, four years, but it might happen that tomorrow it's a different source of me helping other people. Like I love helping people. I love it. I really like I was born to serve and help others. I know that. I do that with my friends, with my daughter, with my partner, with every single person that comes into my life. I am here to serve and I'm super joyful and I love doing it. So for me, it was really inspiring to see others entrepreneurs doing that for their communities or bringing, like I remember at the Master at Columbia, one of the companies that stuck the most with me was a company that was doing dry bathrooms for the people in Peru that live like in the middle of the forest and did not have access to basic hygiene and toilets and everything. They were literally doing their needs on the woods. And this group of entrepreneurs came up with an idea and they were able to give like portable bathrooms. Like that for me is inspiring. That's the kind of people that I pursue and that I love having around. If we look at the role of women entrepreneurs in shaping the future of business and uh, in our world, what aspirations do you have for the future, given the, the challenges that comes with being a woman entrepreneur today? I think we need way more women entrepreneurs out there. And I don't mean no disrespect to men. And this is something like I truly believe that women and men need to work together towards a goal in an equal way. So I'm not saying neither women are better than men nor men better than women. Please don't get me wrong. With that being said, it is also true that the way the women think, and this is a biological thing, it's not personal, it's literally how our brain works. 
we are able to see way more than men do. Like our mind is multiple boxes open at the same time and we go through one to another all the time. Like we do that at home, we do that with our kids, we do that at work. We like, we're constantly jumping from one to the other. The man has no capability of doing that. Men do one box. When he's done with that box, he moves to the other. And when he's done, he moves to that. That's just how our brains work. So to solve most of the issues that are going on today, there's so many things that are fucked up and really bad that we need someone that's able to manage all at once. Because one per time, it's, it's, not, it's not going fast enough in order to really make an impact and really make a change. So for me, a dream team will put together women and men, but women should be taking the decisions and women should be mapping most of the solutions that we're not being able to do today. And like, I, I do feel we are in a highly disadvantaged world where women are left behind. You were saying about the VC founding and that's it. like, I've been pitching Little Rebels for the past three years to raise money. Number one reason why I haven't, I'm a solo founder and I'm a woman. That's ridiculous. Nobody told Mark Zuckerberg he's a solo founder. He cannot build Facebook. Why? Because he's a man. So those kind of biases are there and they happen and I keep leaving them on a daily basis. And I'm like, that no worries. Like that just make me stronger. But it does discourage other women that might be actually creating amazing things that could actually have a real impact in our lives. And that's the main purpose behind Little Rebels. Like I want to show them, hey, you can do this. Like, don't let them make you believe that you cannot. Because the world need more women in, pow in power positions. Like, I don't want your listeners to, <laughs> to misinterpret this. It's a delicate topic, but it's, I see it. Like, I think more and more women are needed in order to be able to tackle a conjunction of problems that, well, men have been in power for forever and they're not being able to solve it. So why not give women a chance and see what happens? Can you share a specific story that, illustrates a joy that your products are actually bringing to children and their families? Yes, of course. So <laughs> one of, like I have two stories that I love the most and I always share them. So one is with a boy. I love, I love when parents buy my dolls to boys and they come and tell me because it's not only for girls, right? So I love when they They really go on and say, this is for my boy. So there's a little boy called Toti that he has an Amelia heart that he loves dearly. And he goes with Amelia everywhere, like literally everywhere. And one day his mom texts me and she was like, I just wanted to thank you and say that your quality, the quality of your plushes is insane. And I was like, oh, thank you. Why is that? Well, so Toti, every time we change his diapers, he demands us to put on cream into Amelia's as well because we're changing her diapers. So Amelia is always full of cream <laughs> and we keep putting her in the washing machine and she keeps coming out like perfect. <laughs> so she was like, since we gave it to him like six months ago, Amelia has literally went into the washing machine on a daily basis and she's impeccable. <laughs> I was like, seriously? She was like, you have no idea. He talks to everybody about how Amelia was an aviator, how she broke records, how like he does not let her go. And then I had another one that it was actually a very bizarre story. They texted me and my first reaction was panicking because they the first question that they asked was if the dolls had drugs on them. And I was like, I'm sorry, what? And she was like, my, <laughs> my daughter won't let go. I don't know what you put in those dolls. Like all the plushes that she used to sleep since she was a baby, they're on the side. Like she would not let go about her Marie Curie and she takes it to school and she shows, and I was like, like for a moment there, my heart stopped. I have to say, was like who approaches someone asking if a product has drugs inside it? It was like, what are you serious? <laughs> But yes, like that brings me so much joy. Like every time a parent comes and say, hey, I love what you're doing. Like my daughter won't get enough. Then they send me pictures of the kids um, playing inside of like, there's one that put together a bunch of chairs as in an airplane. And then she was the pilot with Amelia. And that is exactly what I want to happen, right? For her to know that she can be the pilot and not only the flight attendant. Like, there's nothing wrong. You want to be a flight attendant? Go for it. But uh, you can be a pilot as well if you want. So 
when parents tell me like, yeah, <laughs> she did like an entire, like our living room turned into an airplane. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like she, she was around four or five. She was very little. And she put all the chairs, like one by side, like two pairs, right? Of chairs. And then one in the middle, in the very beginning. And that was her as a pilot. And she was there with Amelia as her co-pilot. And I thought that was awesome. And how has your daughter experienced the play with the doll that you have created, the books? And has she contributed actually to shaping some of the new ideas and evolutions? Every single thing that comes out of Little Rebels does not come out until I have her approval. I always say she's the chief creative office, even if she's not officially. But since very since she was very little, like everything that I've done, I always ask for her feedback on the design, on how does it look, on like I will read the stories to her and the scripts before going live to see if it makes sense. She made a bunch of corrections to the text, for example, like the books and everything, even though I wrote them. Uh, she edited them. <laughs> So she's actually, uh, she's the first little rebel. Like she, she's there by my side every single step of the way. We were always a family that plays a lot. Like I love Legos and uh, we always had a lot of board games. We used to have, we need to go back to that, but we used to have like a weekly game night. So we used to play a lot with hers. Play and game was always a part of our family. And it just came natural, like the plushes and everything. And she carries so much pride on this project like she goes on to her school and to her teachers and she talks about this with such pride that it's like I love it she's the best thing ever what future do you aspire for her to embrace uh, particularly as we've spoken about the the influence of women in society in organizations in entrepreneurship what is the ideal future of the world that you would love her to live in? Hopefully peaceful. Let's start there. Like, I think, especially now with everything that is going on uh, with Israel and Palestine and, and like it arises so many social issues around the world, like you see the reactions from both sides in every single country. So that scares me a lot. So I really hope we as a world finally come into a peace agreement and really stop this nonsense of fighting each other over religions. It's like, it makes no sense. So it's like, just go and pray to whoever makes you happy. Like, you don't have to attack the other in order to be faithful to what you do, you know? So that's the first thing that I hope it's... I, I know it's very naive of me, but I will really look forward to a future in which she has peace, in which climate change doesn't need her alive, hopefully. But on a professional side, actually, like the only thing that I really, 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 really want is for her to be fully happy. Like she has been through so much already. I don't care what she becomes, to be honest. And I don't care what career path she chooses to do or whatever. Like I'm confident that whatever she chooses, she's going to shine on that because she's just like that. And she goes lighting people's lives and I think that's the most precious gift you can have like she enter a friend's life and she brings light into it and she's always constantly giving them little gifts and uh, hugs and telling them nice things and then I don't know we go into the supermarket and she crosses someone and she likes her earrings or her nails or whatever and she's always complimenting people like she's always bringing joy and happiness and I hope she keeps doing that <laughs> when she grows up, like that she doesn't lose that magic innocence somehow. She's very innocent. She's 16, but she's not like the typical teenager. She doesn't have any rage or anything. Like she's super lovable. I just hope the world doesn't mess up with her and she's able to actually grow and, and maintain that actually. And professional wise, honestly, her dream, her entire life was to be a journalist from the New York Times and be a valedictorian from Harvard. Now she wants to be a film director, kind of like what Greta did with Barbie. That's what she wants to do when she grows up. So we'll see what she does. What are some future aspirations that you have for Little Rebels? Can you share with us any insights or future plans? I really hope we can build a foundation five years from now. I really want Little Rebels to become a foundation as well. And we focus on 
getting more girls educated around the world as a foundation. So we have a mini version of the Rebels that we're releasing now, that it's Travel Rebel. We have the Rebels that we have, we have the books. So we are working on a board game as well that interacts with augmented reality and talks about uh, climate change. And we are also working on a TV show to be some sort of like, do you remember the Powerpuff Girls? Like the three little sisters that used to fight crime and stuff like that. Yes. So something similar, but the four rebels come together to fight gender inequality, climate change, bullying, depression, like all the episodes are different adventures. The four of them just come together and they go on adventures and they fight those things and they teach us like good values to our kids. That's what I'm looking for the most. Like I really want to dig in the next two years and get the TV show going. We're already having conversations with Disney Plus Latam, but the idea is to go onto maybe, I don't know, Netflix, Amazon, or one of these giants to pick it up and do it. And then the movie, and then again, conquering the world one dollar at a time. <laughs> I, I love it. Do you have any final thoughts for entrepreneurs on uh, enjoying the journey and finding more joy despite the challenges that may arise? Yeah, celebrate every little victory. It doesn't mean it doesn't matter how small or insignificant it might seem. Trust me, it's important. So if like I don't know, you get an like every time till today, every time I get an order on the mail for a new rebel, I do my little happy dance. For every so every time I get like the Shopify sound about a new purchase, I do like this <laughs> and it's like already on me, but that's a good way to keep me grounded. Right. And like remembering why I'm doing this. And it's like literally every little purchase counts and make a difference. And it's someone that it's believing in my product and it's believing in what I'm doing. So it's, it's way much more than just. I'm purchasing a doll. For me, you're purchasing something that I invented, that I created, and that I thought your kid will need. So thank you for trusting me with that. I know it's not that much for them, but for me it is. So entrepreneurship can be super hard. So a few thoughts is take care of your mental health. That'll be the first one. Like really pay attention. Burnout can happen like this and you don't even notice. Surround yourself with people, especially if you're like solopreneur. Try to find a tribe. There's a bunch of groups of entrepreneurs on Slack, on Facebook, on LinkedIn that are there to support each other and like share resources and stuff. Like do reach out to them. Like most of us are always available. By the way, feel free to reach me out on social media. Like I love to help if I can. And then take time to celebrate your wins because they're fewer than the losses usually, but way more important because those are the things that keep you going. And what I always say is, do not start a business unless you have a very clear why. And that why cannot be to make money. You need to have something else motivating you to go after what you want. Because when things get hard, which they do, the only thing that is going to keep you going, it's not how much money you're going to do, is nobody's going to take away my dream. So you need to keep moving with a clear why in mind. Well, Marjorie, it's been such a pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you so much for sharing your journey and I wish you continued success and really look forward to some of the new initiatives and the movie and everything that you have shared. It's very, very exciting. So congratulations again on all your amazing achievements to date and may the future be filled with joy and many successes in the future for you. Thank you so, so much for having me, for listening, for giving me this space to share my journey. It's been a pleasure and I love what you're doing. So let's keep spreading joy. Thank you. Thank you.